And now, stand-up community subscribers and listeners from around the globe, it's time to Stand Up with Pete Dominic, where we ask the important questions that impact you, your family, and your community. Such as, will this new tropical-flavored beer take my Uncle John to new heights of happiness and bliss? And with new fall fashion styles soon to be released, will I still be able to fit into my skinny jeans? And now, the podcast host who never misses a good old-fashioned kegger in the woods, Pete Dominic. That's right. If you've got a kegger, you can count on me. Don't know what that's about, but I love it. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. Hello and welcome to today's episode of Stand Up. We are off. I am happy to have you joining me and several new folks signing up for subscriptions to be part of our community yesterday. Welcome aboard. Very excited. The aim was to get 10 new subscribers this week, and I think we're, we're halfway there. So who else is going to sign up to join our community, support this daily show Go to StandUpWithPete.com, StandUpWithPete.com right now. Joining me today, two very smart academics. I've got Dr. Jason Johnson, Dr. Michael Mann, both on today's program. Awesome conversations with both. I think you're really going to like them. Also, I've got a lot of news to share with you and want to, of course, invite those of you who are already subscribers to join me tonight at 8 o'clock to talk about it all. 8 Eastern Virtual Hangout, the stand-up happy hour hangout hosted by yours truly each and every Thursday at 8 Eastern unless something gets in the way. But planning to be there tonight. Hopefully I will see you and you can get the link in every Thursday's morning email. Speaking of which, yesterday I asked how many of you read the morning email. Several of you did reply, and I greatly appreciate it, but it was all a shot at listener Joe Liotta, who told me after our date last night that he doesn't actually ever open the morning email for subscribers. And I was deeply hurt. So, those of you who do, thank you. Thank you for reading it. There's a, a picture of, of nature in every morning's email that is, is a great thing to wake up to. And those of you that are not opening it. You're really missing out. So open it today if you are a subscriber. Feeling good? I started my day today with my dog and my friend Ken in the woods. He brings his dog. I bring my dog. We walk. We talk. It is just wonderful. It's a lovely autumn day here in the Northeast. Youngest Julia, 14, on an airplane on her way to Florida with her friends. Her friend's mom was unable to have a, a bar mitzvah for her twin kids. So you got a son and a daughter. My daughter's friends with her daughter. And they are each bringing four friends and going to Florida from Wednesday to Sunday. They rented like a beach house. And she is one lucky, lucky girl. And very, very excited for her. Hope they have a great time and that nobody gets COVID. Shout out to my boy Eric Doust, who he and his wife have just tested positive for COVID. And... Definitely concerned about you, buddy, and uh, if there's anything I can do for you, you, of course, let me know. And this is not over, folks, even though it's maybe pronounced over in certain sectors and certain places and by people like Dr. Scott Gottlieb. People are still getting breakthrough cases. Go get your booster. So many of my friends got their booster. I haven't gotten my booster. I got to go get it. I'm going to think I'm going to get it tomorrow. Can you just go in? I'm just going to go in and get my booster, and then I guess potentially feel crappy for a day, but... Apparently, it is my turn. I've waited my turn, and it's time to leave the shed, get my booster. All right, let's get to the news. Plenty to talk about. Time for the last 24. All right, lots to talk with you about in today's news. Inflation has hit a 30-year high in October due to COVID and supply chain issues. A judge approved a $600 million settlement for Flint, Michigan. Thousands will be eligible for payments over contaminated water. The NFL has punished both Aaron Rodgers, a teammate, and the Green Bay Packers. And by punished, I mean like the lightest of wrist slaps. After Paul Rudd is people's sexiest man alive, which means absolutely nothing. And the trial for a 17-year-old kid who drove to Kenosha, Wisconsin with a gun he borrowed and killed two people continued and his defense teams asked a judge to declare a mistrial Wednesday after the kid took the stand and did a horrible performance of crying that blew up the internet yesterday. So lots to talk with you about, but let's start with something 
somewhat funny. This is a parody ad put together by an activist group called Represent Us, meant to promote the Freedom to Vote Act, one of the voting rights bills Democrats have been pushing for weeks. And it stars actors Mark Ruffalo and Jake Johnson and property brother Jonathan Scott in a new voting rights ad called Electile Dysfunction. Uh, Mediate says a pretty blunt parody of those erectile dysfunction ads where a voiceover ad... Well, let me just play it for you. Is your democracy flaccid? Trouble maintaining a strong coalition? Tired of the parade of disappointing performances? Then you might be one of the 330 million Americans suffering from electile dysfunction. I get all excited about a new bill. The debate gets all hot and heated. We'll move things to the floor. And right when we're about to achieve a joint resolution, bam. Total government shutdown. Premature capitulation. I don't know, every time I get an election, I think maybe this time will be different. Filibusting just doesn't make me feel good anymore. It's embarrassing, okay? Fortunately, there's the Freedom to Vote Act. The Freedom to Vote Act? What's the Freedom to Vote Act? The Freedom to Vote Act, what does that mean? The Freedom to Vote Act ends your tired, sagging, floppy relationship with politics by making Election Day a holiday across the country, banning gerrymandering, expanding voter access, increasing integrity, blocking foreign interference, empowering everyday citizens, and healing our democracy. Now my election is rock solid, and it works everywhere. Oh, it works everywhere. And it's safe. It used to take me forever to find the location. To to vote. vote. (laughs) But with the FTBA, we have all day to get to the polls. And it only takes two minutes. Which I prefer, honestly. She really does. The Freedom to Vote Act is only for democracies healthy enough for electoral activity. Talk to your representative if you are experiencing greased palms, lined pockets, dictators, neo-fascists, or other pre-existing conditions, as you may not be healthy enough for the FTVA. Passing FTVA may cause an increase in being heard, power, a full expression of your inalienable rights, representation, and a rare federal condition called accountability. If you experience voting lines that last over four hours, call your senator, as they have not passed the FTVA. Talk to your senator about the Freedom to Vote Act and demand safer and more satisfying elections today. All right, go to electiledysfunction.us, electiledysfunction.us to learn more. All right, I've got two clips to play for you that you have every right to tell me I'm wasting your time just by playing them, but I had to watch them, so you do as well. You know, I mean, you don't have to listen to them, but this is actor Matthew McConaughey, who's increasingly flirting with politics, but... I, I I play them for you to just show you how good he is at at performing and and talking without actually saying anything. He takes a very long pause in this interview with CNBC's Andrew Ross Sorkin, and I just left it in there. And it's just he's so bizarre and well, kind of entertaining. There's a lot of things he clearly wants to say, but doesn't say them. Bottom line is he is not ready to vaccinate his kids, even though. On Wednesday, one million American kids had their first vaccination, which is big, big news, but not the McConaughey's. Scary. Right now, I'm not vaccinating mine. I'll tell you that. You're not. Um, I'm not vaccinating mine. I want to get some. I've been vaccinated. My wife has been vaccinated. We have a high risk person in our household. My mother who's 90 and she's immune compromised. So why don't, why don't you want your kids to be vaccinated? Now, this is a very long pause. Like This is real time on TV. He just. We run, we go slow on vaccinations anyway, even before COVID. What? Now, mind you, I've chosen, we've quarantined harder than any of our friends have and still are a few years later. Wow. Must be Um, hard. I don't want to, maybe I'm trying to just keep it from my mom. Okay. So we've been doing just a heavy amount of testing, winning everywhere we can. We even take the ones that uh, take the ones with us out of the box where we can do them in our house uh, everywhere we can with anybody we come in contact with. Um, try to do things outdoors. I'm in a position, though, where I can do that. And I understand that not everyone can do that. Right. I don't, I, I can't, I, I couldn't mandate having to vaccinate the younger kids. I still want to find out, I still want to find out more information. He needs more information. And we, I need more McConaughey. Here's a horrifically inartful, he's not great without a script. Explanation of his feeling on Texas's abortion law. The last abortion law in Texas felt overly aggressive, feels overly aggressive to me. Um, you know, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't seem to open up 
any 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 room for a sensible choice to be made at the right time. Um, I believe it's six weeks, uh, which you're not even sure. Um, you know, uh, again, I, I've got some opinion on this. I'm not going to share with you right now because I'll, I'll 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 split some of it. Go. I, I believe in this. I believe in this more responsibility, right. more personal responsibility to make the right choices. And we got to take context with every single, with, with each situation and each, each person's situation, each woman's situation. Um, you know, you hear about someone who gets raped. I, that, 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 that's not, it's not, it's not a woman's choice. That's not a place. It's not a place to say, Oh, you, you need to bring that child into this world. I don't believe, um, you know, abortions were one of those places where we're asked as humans to play, to play God. Right. Um, and that's, uh, that's not necessarily our, 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 our responsibility in our place. The last. Yeah. Sounds like he, he's blaming people for their unwanted pregnancy. He just should be more responsible. Shouldn't have had sex. It felt like that's where he's at. Also uh, playing God. It's re- Women's health care. I mean, we, do we really? I don't know. Th- those are my thoughts on Matthew McConaughey and the fact that he is really not, probably should not put himself out there like that. Just a little advice. Someone whose advice I will take is the Surgeon General Vivek Murthy. He was on CNN correcting some of what McConaughey had to say and more. Here he is with CNN's Aaron Burnett. He's out front, Vivek Murthy. That's what they say, out front. So what I would encourage parents to recognize is, number one, COVID is not harmless in our children. Number we many kids have died, sadly, hundreds of children, thousands have been hospitalized. And as a dad of a child who has been hospitalized in the several years ago for another illness, I would never wish upon any parent Mm -hmm. that they have a child who ends up in the hospital. And the vaccines have shown in these trials for children 5 through 11, they're more than 90 percent effective in protecting our kids from symptomatic infection. And they're remarkably safe as well. The kind of side effects they saw were a sore arm, fatigue, headache. All right. Well, when when are the kids going to be able to take off their masks? How about that, Mr. Surgeon General, Dr. General, Sir, Sir, Dr. Surgeon, Dr. Murthy? Do you think that they should be able to take their masks off? If they're in a classroom, you know, I know the, the incoming New York City mayor is considering this. If you're in a classroom where the teacher's vaccinated, the kids are vaccinated, should a bonus be that you can take off a mask? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, I certainly think getting vaccinated takes us one step closer to that. What the CDC has said is that in areas, you know, that have high or substantial amount of transmission, they want people to still wear a mask for the time being. But as cases come down, yeah. uh, certainly it will become a, a possibility for us to take off our mask. So we just got to keep going in terms of getting vaccinated, taking the safety precautions, as cases come down and stay down, we'll be able to remove a lot of the restrictions that we've been dealing with up until this point. All right. Okay, well, let's head over. Let's go from COVID to climate, head over to Glasgow and check in with Nancy Pelosi, who was there with a delegation of Democrats. And she was asked by a CNN reporter this question. I mean, the, the reporter's accent, Irish accent, is is worth it alone. But I think this is a pretty interesting and important clip. Thank you very much. Uh, Amy Cassidy for CNN. Um, question for Speaker Pelosi, please. Um, is America really back yet if it won't sign on to a global pledge to phase out coal by 2030? And members of your own party say America has not recovered its own moral authority and action needs to be delivered. Thank you very much. Of course, I don't accept the fact that America has not uh, assumed its moral authority in all of this. America is back. Our president was here. Uh, He had achieved. There were many uh, successes that were achieved in collaboration, not dictation or condescension, but in collaboration with other countries, many of whom were ahead of us because we had, of course, the dark period of, uh, of four years uh, preceding the president's uh, administ- President Biden's administration coming into office. So we have great confidence. We have great uh, absolute hope and optimism that the goals will be re- met. Uh, president Biden was the first person in Congress, he tells me, and I take him for his word. Uh, a ju- Al Gore may have another date, but uh, the president's <laughs> first legislation was in 1986 to address the climate crisis. Uh, This is a priority for him, not only a priority, a value. So uh, people will say what people will say, uh, but we know 
uh, that America is back. Well, there you go. Also, Speaker Pelosi weighing in on the subsidies to fossil fuel companies that have been in place forever. I've been trying to get rid of those subsidies uh, for as long as I've had been in a position uh, to do so. Uh, Right now, we have tried to counter, to offset what that is. You have a situation where uh, some of the leading fossil fuel companies, leading oil companies make a trillion dollars a year. They need no incentive to drill, but there is in the Congress still support for them to have that in order to offset that, to recognize that that shouldn't be. Um, just speaking personally now, uh, I, we have in the legislation uh, our goal. We have a goal. We have a vision. We have a goal. We have a timetable. We have milestones. And what our purpose is, is in our legislation uh, to reach those milestones, whether it's by 2030 for 50 percent. That is what we will what we will do. And that's what our legislation enables us to do, to reach the president's goals, our goals. All right. Here's a clip of the transportation secretary. This is Pete Buttigieg, who's also over in Glasgow, England, at the uh, COP26 climate summit saying that labor shortages reflect deeper reckoning against working for, quote, poverty rages, wages. Well, poverty rages and they get poverty wages. I didn't misspeak. I know what I'm talking about. Here's Mayor Pete. I mean, Secretary Pete. But I also think there's a bigger, deeper reckoning going on uh, in this country. You know, we, we went for a long time where uh, I think a lot of people just assumed that working for uh, poverty wages was the only way out. Now we're seeing better wages, even in jobs like, you know, fast food that were not known for generosity and pay or benefits. I do think that'll have an effect. I don't think it'll have an effect overnight. And the transportation department that Pete Buttigieg is the head of also unveiled a multi-agency roadmap to slash greenhouse gas emissions from the U.S. aviation sector with the target of reaching net zero by 2050. The net zero target covers emissions from flights within the U.S. and its territories, as well as U.S.-based airlines international flights. Beyond CO2, the plan aims to get a better handle on other warming impacts of flying like aviation-induced cloudiness, or AIC, which includes contrails, you know, the uh, things that the conspiracy theory mongers think are, are, are controlling us and poisoning us all. All right, what else do I have for you? Here is the brilliant chief of staff for Joe Biden. His name is Ron Klain, super smart guy. He was on CNN with Jay Tapper yesterday talking about not only Senator Manchin and other concerns about, about inflation and the argument that Democrats are now making is the strongest case to fight inflation is to pass Build Back Better. Let's listen to Ron Klain make the claim. Obviously, you need his vote. Do you think that Build Back Better in its current form is essentially dead because of inflation? Oh, quite the opposite, Jake. I think that Senator Manchin's concerns make the strongest possible case for Build Back Better. Uh, one of the biggest expenses families face is child care. Our bill will cut the cost of child care for middle class families in half. Another thing that people are really feeling the pinch of is prescription drugs. Our bill, Build Back Better bill, lowers the cost of prescription drugs, puts a cap on what seniors pay for their drugs. People are pinched by uh, elder care costs. It brings that down. By health insurance premiums, the bill brings that down. And of course, for families with children, the bill provides a tax cut of $250 per child per month. So I think if your concern is the cost of living, it's a concern we have here at the White House. It's a concern Senator Manchin shares. The Build Back Better bill is the best answer we have to bring those costs down. By the way, it also does it without adding a penny to the federal debt it's fully paid for and without raising a penny of taxes on families making less than $400,000 a year. All right, there's Joe Biden's chief of staff, Ron Klain. Now let's listen to Joe Biden, who said he's going to somehow create good paying union jobs, not 12 bucks an hour, like 45 bucks an hour. Here he is talking about the infrastructure bill, which he'll sign on Monday. China's out spending us on research and development. China's out spending all these, these other countries are as well. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create good paying union jobs. Union. Not good job, Not $12 an hour, not $15 an hour, 45 bucks an hour and up with good benefits. So you can raise the family on and build the middle class out. And jobs that cannot be outsourced. You can't outsource these jobs. 
and I'm going to transform our transportation system with the most significant investment in passenger rail in the past 50 years, in roads and bridges, most significant investment in 70 years, and investments in public transit that we've done over the period. And you know, this is going to it's going to modernize our ports with 17 billion dollars in investment. 17 billion dollars in investment. We're going to reduce congestion. We're going to address repair and maintenance backlogs, deploy state-of-the-art technologies, and make our ports cleaner and more efficient. And we're going to do the same with our airports and freight rail. We're going to create jobs replacing lead water pipes that are here in Maryland as well as every other state in the union. Okay, well, there you go. That's all the sound I have for you. I didn't take any of the sound out of the Kyle Rittenhouse trial yesterday. That dominated a lot of the news cycle yesterday, including his performance crying which was so it was really cringy it was clearly he he was performing and it was really very bad and everybody reacted to how bad it was but the case is i I just don't want to weigh in on it i'm i've read several articles about it i'm gonna listen to podcast about it and try to get more informed so that I can talk about it with folks at the Hangout as well as the Ahmad Arbery case. I just haven't paid close enough attention to these cases. I do need to I would rather have legal experts on to talk about it than just spout off irresponsibly. I don't want to do that even though I have opinions and I have thoughts. I highly recommend Ellie Mistal's piece at The Nation titled, I hope everyone is prepared for Kyle Rittenhouse to go free. I also shared on my Twitter timeline, my old friend John DeVore, who wrote an interesting piece about it as well. But there is more news. I do have more headlines without as much context. Here it is now. It's time for the news dump. Brian Williams talked the talk, now is making the jump to a life outside with happiness on today's news dump. Here it is, and it reads like this. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. Well done, Pete. Okay, I want to start in Virginia, where school board members are now literally recommending that we burn books. Aaron Blake has a great piece aggregating all the different schools and the books and the banning and the burning. Read it at the Washington Post, and I may get him on and ask him about it. He's doing good reporting on it. But in Virginia, the school board voted 6-2-0 to order the removal of these books. Berkeley District Representative Aaron Gramp was not in attendance with the vote on that issue. All right, two board members said they would like to see the removed books burned. Quote, I think we should throw those books in a fire, said one. And another said he wants to see the books before we burn them so we can identify within our community that we are eradicating this bad stuff. Now, just quickly, I have one point to make about the book burning and banning, which is just because it's not like the olden days. I mean, if you don't want your kid to learn something or read something or see something... Prohibition isn't going to work. They're going to find it. I mean, it's called the Internet. You can't just burn things. They exist in perpetuity on the Internet. It makes it harder to teach them in school. That's for damn sure. It does make a difference. But it just looks so stupid in the Internet age to be talking about banning and burning books. And it's really hard to believe that this is the place that we're at. But I highly recommend reading Aaron Blake's piece in the Washington Post that aggregates a bunch of different districts and books that they are wanting to ban. And yes... Burn in 2021. We were warned about this. The number of Americans applying for unemployment benefits fell to a new pandemic low, 267,000 last week. Another sign that the job market is recovering from last year's sharp coronavirus downturn. Michael Bloomberg announced yesterday that he would spend $120 million in an effort to reduce the soaring number of deaths from drug overdoses. He announced at a healthcare summit that he'd organized, pledged more than doubles the $50 million philanthropic commitment he made toward the same goal in 2018. His pledge follows a preliminary finding that the Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that 93,000 people had died from drug overdoses in 2020, the majority of them from using opioids. The number of deaths during the first calendar year of the pandemic grew 30% over the total for 2019, the highest for a single year on record. I tell my daughter, never take a pill. Both tell my daughters, never take a pill. Marijuana, alcohol, I don't want you to do either, but just don't take fentanyl. You got, I mean, not that you would know that it is. Don't take it. 
So I wonder what you've told your kids, but have that conversation often. Remind them often. Okay, what's next here? Oh, this is from the Associated Press uh, that writes, Never in its 50-year 50, 50 history has Starbucks relied on union workers to serve up frothy lattes as its US, at its U.S. cafes. Wait, Starbucks has been here for 50 years? But some baristas aim to change that. Workers at three separate Starbucks stores in and around Buffalo, New York, are expected to begin voting by mail this weekend whether they want to be represented by Workers United, an affiliate of the Service Employers International Union. Wow, a union vote in Buffalo for Starbucks employees. The National Labor Relations Board's regional office in Buffalo, which approved the vote last month, scheduled to start mailing ballots Wednesday evening and count the votes on December 9th. Starbucks doesn't like it. The corporate headquarters, uh, they're asked for a delay in the election while they wait for the full National Labor Relations Board in Washington to review its case, but the vote may proceed even as that review is held. Read more about it at the Associated Press. Another SpaceX crew Dragon capsule carrying four astronauts this time roared into outer space yesterday atop a Falcon 9 rocket marking the kickoff of SpaceX's fifth crewed mission to orbit. The spacecraft with three astronauts and one Europe, uh, American NASA astronauts and one European Astronaut on board will spend all day Wednesday maneuvering closer to the International Space Station where it's going to dock on Thursday, kicking off a six-month science and research mission. Then the astronauts spend the next day strapped inside their spacecraft as it maneuvers through orbit and prepares to link up with the space station, which orbits more than 200 miles above the Earth's surface. Docking scheduled for 7.10 p.m. tonight, Thursday, if you are listening on the 11th of November. All right, well, that's all I've got for you for news today. How about that? I couldn't find anything else worth mentioning. I'm sure I missed many stories, as I do every day. You can always send me yours, standupwithpete at gmail.com, for all of your ideas, suggestions, and any way that you want to help produce and grow the show every day. If you haven't given the show a review on Apple iTunes, that is a great thing to do. It helps people find it. I guess it boosts it up in the algorithm. Go write what you like. About the show, give it five stars on Apple iTunes. All right, now it's time to get to my guests. How about that? Coming up, the great climate scientist, Dr. Michael Mann. But before that, I had another wide-ranging, wonderful conversation with Dr. Jason Johnson. Provocative, too. There were some disagreements there, and I put out some of my own ignorance on issues, as I always do, and, and he gave me some... Uh, some great insights and better ways to think about things. It's always a great conversation. I always learn so much from him. And about halfway through, he started his his phone started uh, our connection, I should say, started cutting out. So I switched to his phone, but I cut in and mentioned that. But I think this is great. We started uh, talking about whether or not we celebrate Christmas too early, and then we moved on to talk about black sports celebrations versus white sports celebrations critical race theory, and much more. Always a great conversation with Dr. Jason Johnson. You can listen to his podcast, A Word, on Slate Podcasts. You can see him as the regular contributor at MSNBC, of course. He is a professor at Morgan State University of Political Science and History and Journalism, and he is a really good friend of mine on Twitter at Dr. Jason Johnson. Let's go, Dr. Jason Johnson. Okay, so first and foremost, I'm not going to ask only you this. I'm going to start asking pretty much everybody this, and I'll have a conversation on Thursday, uh, tonight at the Hangout. Uh, too early to decorate for Christmas. You are apparently outraged? Oh, deeply, deeply. First off, the liberals try and steal Christmas from us. The liberals? And now the liberals tried to steal Christmas from us, and now they're trying to force Christmas upon us before Thanksgiving. I am deeply offended and deeply angered by this. And uh, if it weren't for these woke monsters who can't decide how much they love Christmas or want to destroy it, I would I would be out in these streets. Well, I don't know why it's got to be so divisive. Let's just let's take it down a notch. I have (laughs) evolved on this issue. I, Mm -hmm. too, was I I love Christmas. I'm a big Christmas spirit person, decorations, all of it, although we could have a separate conversation about inflatable lawn ornaments, for which, of course, I've been very vocal. And I do think the penalty should be death. But that's fair. The. I've evolved. I'm okay with a pre Thanksgiving no. preparation. I, I'm not sure it's right after Halloween, but if it's a couple of weeks, I've evolved. Grow up. You, you and I, so, so you and I, I've, I've, I've talked to class about it. I'm sure you talked to your daughters about it. You and I are old enough to remember 
when I, I don't like, like, dude, I don't even think when I was a kid, right. Getting transformers and He-Man figures for Christmas. Um, I remember there used to be a gap between Thanksgiving and Christmas time. I remember yes. like, yes. Yeah. Like Christmas time started maybe two weeks before Christmas or maybe the first week of December, but there was a gap in time. I'm trying to remember. I don't, I don't, but I'll have to look it up somewhere. I don't remember the first time. I don't think black Friday became a thing until I was in high school. Like, I, like the idea that like everybody, because the day after Thanksgiving for my family, that just meant you sat around the house and maybe we went to the movies, but the idea of going shopping the day after Thanksgiving, that was a nineties thing. I don't think that was like a, a standard idea. Nobody was thinking about Christmas that well, quick. A lot has you changed. Come up with your list. A lot has changed in finding any type of joy in every <laughs> single moment, especially when uh, it's more tangible, visual decorations. I don't know. We're all we're, every everything's a holiday now. I think we need we need the joy. We have to have things to look forward to. But when they overlap like this, like I understand. Around- your- I understand where you feel. I'm just telling you, I used to be like you. <laughs> we're around, we're, we are. We are. You were an angry same. black man, Pete. You were, you were an angry black man with glasses. That's where you were. You were me. I was you. <laughs> oh, well, now I'm an angry white man. Now he's an angry white like man I with said, a hard R. I've evolved. I've got an R now. I he's keep a hard it. R in that angry. I keep it in my pocket. <laughs> Never take it out. <laughs> Put it on other people. Put it on. So speaking of uh, Christmas and race, because you started it. <laughs> someone I just I read this on yesterday's news segment. Uh, Old Navy is selling uh, pajamas culturally appropriate. Uh, black Santa pajamas. Like, okay. uh, you know, uh, pictures of a black Santa all over the pajamas. Mm-hmm. Um, shoot, can, can I wear Can I get them? You can wear black Santa pajamas. I uh, there's going to be a black people committee meeting when uh, to get together. Uh, well, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, we, it, Fair enough. We, we knew it had to be convened after the whole thing with Joshua Jackson and Jody Allen. We had to have some discussion with Jody, whatever her name is. What happened there? Uh, well, we just we were having a discussion about that. That was that was on the agenda for the hidden oh. black people meeting. And then we're going to talk about this whole black Santa clothing thing. So there'll be a lot of things, but I'm under the impression right now, the preliminary leaks of negotiations are that white people can actually wear black Santa gear, but not do black Santa black face. We got to, we got to be careful out there. I'm I'm not, I'm not an idiot. I'm not uh, trying to take too much. I'm just, you know, I just (laughs) think that I think there are, I think they're funny I think they're funny, um, and I want to see if anybody reacts to them. The problem is, of course, they'll only be, you know, pajamas. It's only going to be in front of my family, so. I think the reaction, if you were to go to the mall in pajamas, that alone right, would exactly. be interesting. And if people were offended, you would say, you're a racist. And then you have a whole other thing. Just tell them they're racist because they don't respect your Black Santa romper. Yeah. Or whatever it is. Yeah. Okay, so that's one thing I wanted to get out of the way. And, and <laughs> another plug for Old Navy, apparently. By the yes. way, in the ad for the pajamas, mm-hmm. it's seemingly a gay male couple. He is black. One guy's black and one guy's white. Of course. And there's three black kids. So you've heard me talk about this before. We've talked about this before. I yeah. I was there for the pajamas, not for the gay adoption and, and, and I'm like, yeah, we've talked about this we re- recently. And why? How do we feel about it? Well, I, I, look, I have no problem with with queer couples adopting kids oh, or no, having that's kids. Not- yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to make this clear and clear. No, unless I, somebody slices no, this the up. Ad. It's the ad. It's the no. You it's know, not the. Like, I, I'm a turf. Um, <laughs> I mean, like, but 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 I, but again, like. The, I I've, I have been on this. This will be something I continue. I will I will die on this Jonah Hill or this Kevin Hill or this One Tree Hill, whatever hill you want to call it. Yeah. Um, I am an advocate of seeing images of black love and why it is that we consistently have to see the only way we see black people affectionately loving each other and not being wacky families and commercials is when we're in interracial couples. I don't appreciate that. And it's not to say anything about people who have found love with someone who is of a different color or a different race. But that ain't the there's a difference between how people are living their real lives and what's marketed. We almost never see black queer couples on TV ever. 
they're always, always interracial couples. And, and of the black queer couples that I know, most of them have black partners. Almost all of them have black partners. And they never see that on TV. Mm-hmm. But this is the kind of disingenuous diversity stuff that these networks come up with. Oh, we'll show diversity as long as it's black people with white people. Well, th- there's the the programming, which is one calculation. But the, there's, there's also, I, I don't think we were talking about that as much as we were talking about ads. Yeah. Like, I, oh, well, yeah. It's the ads and the program. It's the same yeah. problem. Yeah. 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 I mean, like it's, 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 it's every other. So I was just having this discussion this morning um, with some uh, writer friends and actor friends of mine. We were talking about uh, Bob Hart's Abishola on CBS. And you know, I, I, I watched a couple episodes of that show. I was very critical of it online uh, so much so that I was actually like reached out to by the network. And we were all having this conversation about <clears throat> um, whether or not it was a black show. And I mean, one, CBS generally doesn't make shows for black people or targeted African-American audiences. Um, But we're like, no, it's 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 about a white guy who finds a Nigerian woman and they fall in love after he has a heart attack, whatever. I said, but this is not written really with African-Americans in mind. Um, Most of these shows aren't They're They're interracial relationships written from the perspective of white people with very little agency. And this is not to insult uh, the the Nigerian um, uh, black Nigerian woman who's a comedian and British who was sort of part of being one of the showrunners. Um, but these are still shows on the terms of the white gaze. And they're not really written from the perspective of the black and brown people who end up being the sprinkle and the spice on the story. White gaze, G-A-Y-S. <laughs> no, I, no, I wasn't. I, white gaze, G-A-Z. No, I, I don't know what you meant. When these, because I wasn't sure about that show. So when you talked about that show, I wasn't sure if you meant the white gaze, like from the white yeah, the point of view. Yeah, the gaze as in from the eyes. The point yeah. of G A Z E. Yeah, G A Z E. No, I got all uh, the intersectionality of it all, and oh, not God. knowing the show, it was yeah. all real. I'm leaving that in. <laughs> right, I know. I know your question. I know I, all of the misunderstandings are the best parts. Yes, yes, the white gaze, uh, the white gaze from the eyes. Yes. <laughs> I don't think you would use the phrase the white gaze. Anyway, it's like that's so offensive. Should, should have known better. I was just like, from the point of view of the white gaze? Uh, okay. Speaking of the uh, white gaze, which, by the way, is my new band. And we are G A Z E, though. We're not assholes. Yeah. It's G A Y Z. Yeah. I keep seeing you on Twitter uh, uh, tweeting outrage about uh, what seems to be a double standard in sports when black athletes celebrate uh, a a score, a touchdown, especially I guess Mm -hmm. it's in football. Maybe it's uh, elsewhere. Uh, they are they're they're more likely to be penalized for some kind of excessive celebration than the whites. And yeah. I don't know a how we can tell if anybody's charting such things. And b why do you think it matters so much? And by the way, I did see that rant that I should I should include the audio from that commentator on ESPN, which was it made it it certainly helped me understand it a little bit more. But but go ahead. Oh yeah, Ryan uh, Ryan Clark. Well, he Are was talking about like. I'll find it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Ryan Clark is amazing. All right, this is Pete jumping into the conversation with Jason and and me from yesterday. Is that confusing? Okay, so Jason's con- uh, connection starts cracking up here for the next thirty seconds or so, and then I switch over to the phone. Also, this conversation is about to get really interesting because it becomes less about sports and football and more about kind of black, white, ethnic cultural celebrations, the way that we react to each other and events in public, et cetera, and more. So strap in now back to the conversation. But yeah, so first off, the whole idea of taunting as as a penalty is something that I, I tend to disagree with. I mean, you know, these are sports. We're watching it for celebration. We're watching it for excitement. We're watching it so that we can. I, I, I mean, I think, OK, and, and I'm not even trying to be I'm not trying to virtue signal here. Um, but one of the greatest celebrations that I can think of for a professional sport was the icky uh, shuffle. Icky the, was the icky shuffle. But I forget. Was was it was it Abby Wambach? 
who was who was the U.S. women's soccer player? Brandy, like, Brandy Chastain. I was there. Brandy, I wasn't. Yeah. In, I wasn't in the arena. I was watching. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. she runs and she slides. It's freaking amazing, yeah. right? Yeah, like like awesome. like ESPN made a joke about it with like her and Kevin Garnett. Like she wins in like foosball. He's like, why? Wait, where's the shirt? Right? <laughs> what, right. What do you do? So it's like that's why we watch those celebrations are iconic. So the idea. Look, I get. In the 90s, where they were like, hey, Reggie Miller, you can't do the throat slash thing when you're on the court. Like, that looks violent. That's not cool. And we've had, you know, fighting on stage, whatever. Okay. The idea that a player, you know, that DK Metcalf can score a touchdown and run up and hug the goalposts and he gets fined for taunting. The idea that Cassius Marsh, who was a, a, a white player, uh, but he's covered in tats. He looks like Tyler Maine from the X Men. That you know he gets in for taunting for doing something really simple. It it seems arbitrary. It offers a harsher penalty on black players. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, DK Metcalf, who's a wide receiver for the Seattle Seahawks, he can make an incredible catch for a touchdown. He runs and hugs the goalpost. Doesn't hump it. Doesn't you know caress it. Doesn't twerk on it. He runs and hugs the goalpost. He gets hit with a taunting penalty, you know, but Ryan Tannehill, who is the quarterback for the um, Tennessee Titans, he routinely scores touchdowns. And if he does, he jumps into the end zone and sort of reenacts the, uh, you know, the, the Michael Jordan logo. Like he'll jump up and flip the football in his hands, you know, and, and, and spread his legs out. And personally, I don't have a problem with either one. But I'm seeing more and more and more. It's not just because the predominant, uh, you know, wide receivers and running backs or whatever in the league happen to be African-American. I think the whole idea of a taunting penalty itself is ridiculous. And I think it stems from the fact that a lot of these league owners and league management and everything else like that, they are generally very conservative, hostile and dare I say racist given the policies that they seem to promote in their favor of. And they're always trying to keep these black bodies in check. So let's create an arbitrary rule. We get to smack these guys around from time to time based on whatever it is we happen to be feeling in the moment. It doesn't make any sense. It's not an issue of whether or not, because I'm watching these teams and I'm like, well, I remember, gosh, was it 10, 12 years ago, there was an attempt to make a taunting rule to limit the the sort of football celebrations, right? And they're like, oh, we don't want guys, you know, doing full performances in the end zone. Why the hell not? Why the hell not? You just scored a touchdown. You spend your whole life doing this. You know, some of the best performances in the league are, you know, a little coordinated dance that players do in the end zone. You know, there was a, again, I'm a Seahawks fan, but I mean, Tyler Lockett did this thing where he scores this great touchdown. And he reenacted the, the Iverson step over, over mm-hmm. Tyrone Lue in the 2004, uh, sorry, I guess it was the 2001 NBA Finals. Let these damn guys play. But again, the NBA, the, the NFL, the NBA, all of these leagues are generally run by conservative and, dare I say, <laughs> racially hostile men and women in most cases. You can tell that by how they do their labor negotiations and they pick and choose how they enforce rules. And especially when it comes to black players, look at what's happening with Aaron Rodgers versus how a lot of black players and teams were treated last year. I don't know if there's any kind of way to measure how white players are treated versus black players, but there would seem to be a major cultural difference with how black people and white people behave in such situations. Speaking from the point of view of a comedian, Mm -hmm. black crowds, if they're predominantly black, and even if they're just some, you know, the minority Mm -hmm. in the crowd, act completely different at comedy shows, in churches, Dance clubs. I'm not saying, obviously, I'm not saying they're monolithic that everybody dances, whatever. But there is certainly right. a cultural behavior around kind of a, I don't know, I'm sure this has been talked about in an intellectual way. And I'm just muddling my way through it for the first time because I'm coming about it. But like, there's a difference. There's a difference in the way black folks are often more physically extroverted. And, and it's all clearly cultural, whereas white people are more. Let's just say I'll let's just say boring and reserved, which is not necessarily a judgment, by the way, on either behavior. Well, and and see, even that, though, I I think even that is is unintentionally reductionist, because what you're really talking about is whatever groups of people are marginalized in a society, they tend to 
they tend to have a tendency to celebrate in more expressive and loud and engaged ways because victories for those particular communities may be more few and far between. And let's Ooh, be honest, yeah. white people tend, I mean, cause, cause think about, think about Irish celebrations and think about, you know, Italian celebrations and stuff like that, you know, yeah, maybe they're a little different today, but if you went 60 or 70 or 80 years ago, you know, it was like, God, these, these Italians are acting so wild and crazy. Yeah. Cause they don't have a lot of, they don't have a lot of W's to count. So they are going to party in a different way and they are going to express themselves in a different way. But here's the thing. Even the idea of reserve is not necessarily indicative of how the majority of white people celebrate or, or celebrate in sports. Look at, I mean, look, you know, college victories and, 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 and thousands of white kids tear down stadiums. They tear down stadiums. They flood the streets. They tear, you know, whenever you've seen a massive riot of people after a sporting event, even when they win, <laughs> tearing things down, burning things, and everything else like that, that ain't that ain't that ain't black folk. That's <laughs> yeah, not how black true. people celebrate. I mean, there are black people there sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's black people <laughs> but there, it is definitely but definitely like, more. Yeah, certainly because black people aren't going to damage property over a win. You might damage no, property as like a, a result win, of an, 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 <laughs> but as a result of an outrage, maybe. But not a, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Like, no, like, yeah. like we may tear something up if someone's murdered by a cop. But like if our hockey team, if the city hockey team wins, yeah. if Duke basketball wins, you don't see a bunch of black people out in the streets tearing shit the right. hell up. I mean, right, it just right. it's not how we do. <laughs> uh, you make a really good point about the reductionist you know, how that's a re reductionist view. And also, you know, you, you certainly black celebration, like everything else has been stolen. Like I'm trying to describe how a black, you know, player dunks and then stomps his feet and barks yeah. into the wind. You see white guys doing the exact same type of celebration after we mm -hmm. often copy each other. I mean, you know, I mean, there's, so it's, it's yeah, it, putting W's on the board and feeling that feeling of exuberance after being held down, and that this is my way of doing it. Does there need? Do we need cultural conditioning with the referees? Well, no. We the referees just need to get the just need to get the f out of the way. Just get the f out of the way and let people celebrate. By the way, the, I don't like taunting. I don't like going and getting in somebody's face. We'll I, see, but that's but here's different the thing. than it, than humping the goalpost, even if he was exactly. But but I also I don't mind you taunting the people in the stands. However, that's entertaining. I just the idea that two guys are both you know, in this case, let's say two black guys have both worked hard. The one guy is in the secondary covering the guy. The the defense guy is as humiliated as the offense guy is celebrating. I don't like it. I don't. That does strike me as like a, a bad. Form to but taunt here's into somebody's thing. face. I don't love it. Here's the thing. There are this is the classic example of a rule in search of a problem. Because the justification from the NFL yeah. was always like, we're trying to do this to stop fighting. Fighting isn't really all that common in the NFL. It isn't. And and more importantly, you see a lot more fighting in, oh, I don't know, hockey. OK, or or the fights that you see sometimes in baseball, which is always amazing to me, because if you're angry enough to run all the way at the pitcher, like at no point as you're running that, you know, 30 yards or whatever, it's like, did you calm down and think about this wrestling? There's there's fights in all sorts of sports. I mean, think about it. It's like, dude, like by the time you get there, are you still mad? Or are you just mad he made you run that far? Like, that's crazy. He really, I, I can't believe I haven't heard a comic talk about how far that run is. <laughs> There's a lot yeah. there. A lot that can <laughs> that happen. Is a there. Trek. Right. <laughs> he could have apologized five times by the time you get to the mound, but you're still like, you know what? God damn it. I ran this far. Like <laughs> it's just one of those things. So it's like, no, it is. It's about policing black bodies. And there's always this sort of hostility. There's always this sort of undercurrent. It's like, oh, we don't want any fights. First off, the NFL is violent, but you don't really have any more fights in the NFL than you do anywhere else. And they certainly in hell, these guys are in equipment and I don't mind taunting as long as, and again, refs do this all the time. They break guys up all the time. Hey, Hey, break it up, break it up, break it up. The, the, and everybody continues. The reason why there's a, a pretty obvious reason why there's not as many fights in football, because if somebody does something, you, the next play, you can hurt them by design. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that, that's why you don't see, you know, yeah. you're not going to see a full brawl. Plus like dudes are in pads. You can't punch them. You know, for a fact, if you take your helmet off. So the whole thing, it's ridiculous. And as far as I'm concerned, 
like anything else in sports. You don't like what I just did? Stop me next time. You don't like me dancing and shaking my ass in the end zone? Then keep me from getting in the end zone. That's how you play the game. You don't get mad at somebody. I don't mind. I mean, and think about this. Think about this. Think about, you know, Steph Curry hits a three from the freaking logo and does a little shimmy, right? And, and we love that. That's why we like Steph. Most famous, iconic NFT video on the face of the planet is Michael Jordan hitting a three in a playoff game and shrugging his shoulders like, shit, I didn't even know I was going to make that one. <laughs> but that's what he does, right. right? We love that. Is that taunting? Yeah, it is. Yeah. That's okay. You know, fine. I'm okay with that. I'm I, that I'm I was very specific with the taunting I didn't like. Yeah, I mean, well, like I said, if you're going to if you're going to yell in someone's face, yeah, that's what I guess. That, I yeah, that should never be okay. Yeah. But then again, the current rules ex- you didn't need a taunting rule for that. You didn't need a taunting rule. You would just you know the refs would get into that all the time. No, you don't yell in somebody's face. Let me ask you: Do you have time for one more big question? Yeah, of course. Okay, I um. The critical race theory strategy, which has been pretty well documented how it started and and, and, and how it's gone, has mm-hmm. been just a chef's kiss of brilliant propaganda. And what I my argument has been, there's just no way to have gotten out in front of that. And it's really very challenging to combat once it is out there. I've been in the trenches on this one in my community. Yeah, and yeah, I'm, I've seen the video. We talked I'm about talking it. to, you know, my neighbors who believe this stuff. I'm engaged. I'm reading everything mm-hmm. about it. And and my my point is that this wasn't a messaging war. Th- no. This was, we know where it was a result of the, the kind of people called a white lash, whatever you want to call it, of the Black Lives Matter movement, the progress made after George Floyd, the curiosity, the, the, the fight to, to educate folks and businesses and schools. We, I, we know what, what it was, but it just. It really worked. It it was so successful, and we have a lot of catching up to do. And I'm in for that fight, and I'm ready for it. And it's the fight of our generation. And I'm talking to the whites, but but um, <laughs> I, that's how I feel. I feel like it was brilliantly done. It's a it's a great propaganda. It's like the swift boating of John Kerry. We, we didn't see it coming. Never thought you'd be able to do that. They did it. Boom, worked. They they convinced. Thousands of people, millions of people about this shit to win elections. I disagree. Oh, I disagree good. vehemently. Okay, uh, and the reason I disagree is because this ain't new. <clears throat> OK, this is critical race theory um, is the same thing as 2004 uh, in Ohio. And you had the all these state referendums on on, uh, you know, kids are being taught that Sally has two mommies. You know, when that book came out, I was like, oh my God, the gay agenda is being taught in school. That's what they were talking about in 2004. And then, you know, a couple years later, you know, 2010 or so, it's like, oh my gosh, they're implementing Sharia law. Sharia law is yep. being able, we got to yep. fight against yep. Sharia law. And then, and then it was the caravan. Oh my gosh, we got to do something about the caravan, the caravan of Mexicans who are going to sneak into the country. And then after that, it was, uh, it was MS-13. Oh, there's this Mexican gang, MS-13, and they're invading Northern Virginia. They're all over Loudoun County, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same damn thing. And remember, Pete, remember, because people don't mention it as much now, but remember, for two years now, it was the 1619 Project was the greatest threat to innocent white minds and public schools. And now it's just easier to call it critical race theory. It's all the same damn thing. It is telling white people, Negroes and and brown people are going to harm you. They're going to do to you what you passively and tacitly know that you've been doing to them for centuries. And we have to fight back because I will say this in a general way. This is a general anecdotal way, because I think there are many white parents in America, not all, but many white parents in America who fear their children going to school and learning something that will challenge or or weaken their authority over their kids. And I would say that a lot of African-Americans in this country uh, and a lot of poor people in this country and a lot of immigrants to this country love the idea 
of their kids going to school and learning and becoming greater, bigger, stronger, or more educated than them because they know what education can do for you as an oppressed person in this country. And not a lot of white people or not as many white people necessarily feel that way. There's a lot of white people who send their kids off to school every day, not all, some, who send their kids off to school every day with trepidation that my son or daughter is going to learn something that's going to make them come back and look at me differently. And I don't want that to happen. I want the school to go and reinforce my damn values. Whereas a black parent sends their kid to school and the kid comes back and it's like, hey, you know what I learned? I learned that, you know, I don't know, X, Y, and Z. I learned about Eid. I learned about Diwali this week. I did. A lot of black parents are like, shit, I learned that at school. That's great. You know? <laughs> we didn't, we didn't learn that sort of thing. But white parents, some don't have that same attitude. That's all critical race theory is. It's just white fear. It's not new. It's not brilliant. It is just a reflection. It's the same people. And, and I got to tell you this, Pete, because this, and again, it, you, you are uniquely qualified in this because, you know, you've been to the school board meetings, you've shown the video, you've had these conversations. You and I have this sort of, we've had this agreement, sometimes disagreement. I don't believe in Virginia either. I don't believe there is anybody who's been radicalized by critical race theory. These are people who are already willing to hear it. And you know why I know they weren't radicalized by critical race theory? You know why I know there wasn't some heretofore neutral parent in the suburbs who heard about critical race theory and now suddenly they're in favor of Republicans and now they're thinking the insurrection is fine? Because what's the greatest real complaint that parents have had for the last 18 months? That their kids have been taking virtual damn classes on a laptop or an iPad in the middle of the kitchen table. So you've been in the damn classroom with your kids for a year and a half. Did you hear any critical race theory? No, but you might have heard something that you, something that you didn't like. But but see, that's that just sounded, it. That sounded liberal. But see, that's the problem. The problem that we're talking about here is that most of these parents, because it's beyond. And like I said, I have an idea, you know, how Democrats should respond to it. But most of these parents, this is not even an issue of. Critical race theory is not taught in high schools. It's not taught in elementary schools. You're not talking what you're talking about. Most of these parents can't even identify some dangerous thing that their kids have well, learned. Yeah, right. That's the point I've tried to make over and over in my yeah. community. What class, what teacher, what lesson? Right. Like, like when did you, when, when were you walking upstairs and your, your, your ninth grader was you know, taking a class in the kitchen table and you heard the teacher say, you know, as, as a white person, you are guilty. Like, when did you ever hear that? And in none of these stories, none of these thousands of angry parents who are supposedly showing up at these conferences, not one of them can identify the teacher. And you, Pete, know this and every parent out there knows this. You know, if a teacher is done wrong. Right. Like parents have no idea, have no problem. With like, yeah, this teacher said the following. Uh, it was totally inappropriate, blah, blah, blah. The fact that none of these people can bring the teacher forward, the fact that none of these people have ever said this is supposed to be a freaking math class. And why was this teacher talking about me, too? Right. Like, Because <laughs> then you might have an argument. But no, all they're basically saying is we hate black people. We hate black people and we don't want our kids to learn a damn thing. We don't want our kids to learn. And, and remember, Pete, not that, again, that we need to know that these people are lying. But this is like I said, we have to stop calling Republicans brilliant for doing stuff that was always been available. The same damn people who are fighting and screaming. Remember, the same people who Trump tried to motivate to vote for him in 2018 and 2019 because they wanted to protect monuments because we can't erase history are the same damn ones who are saying, I don't want critical race theory because we can't teach kids about bad history. It's the same people. So you know it has nothing to do with history. And what? you know it has nothing to do with their kids being exposed to something. They just don't like black people. If I were to strike the word brilliant, it would still be true that it was effective. No, I no. disagree. I disagree. Because, I, because, because just like defund the police, and 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 Black Lives Matter in 2020, you have a lot of centrist and conservative Democrats who are running around with this myth. Oh, the reason that Jamie Harrison lost to Lindsey Graham. I like Jamie. I know Jamie. 
The reason that Jamie Harrison lost to Lindsey Graham is because of defund the police. That's what James Clyburn was saying. Yeah. You know, uh, oh, that about that specific election. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He said defund mm-hmm. the police hurt us. Um, you know, you got people, you got, you got James Carville saying, you know, wokeism is messing yep. up the Democratic Party and blah, blah, blah. That's bunk. That's bunk. And not one of them can prove it empirically. And you can go to places like Georgia. You can go to some of the few districts uh, in 2020 that flipped from red to blue. You know, Metro Atlanta, Metro Atlanta had massive, massive protests massive police responses to protests about, uh, I mean, local violence in addition to George Floyd, the state still flipped blue. Okay, Kenosha, Wisconsin, where you have Kyle Rittenhouse, Minneapolis, where you had George Floyd, the biggest hot spots where you had people screaming about Black Lives Matter, we got to do something about the police and everything. It's like every single damn one of those places flipped blue or stayed blue. So you can't tell me that these issues being on the table is going to hurt you because the evidence electorally has not shown up. It just hasn't. But, but it's always easy for these guys to punch left because at the end of the day, as I said earlier this week, you know, James Carville, when he says, we got to do something about wokeism, we got to wokeism is going to cost us this, that, the other. What I hear him saying is black people shut up. Y'all Negroes need to shut up. You Brown people need to be quiet. When at the end of the day, just like critical race theory, you have very few people out there, whether it's John McWhorter or Carville or, or Clyburn or anybody else, very few of these people can actually tell you what the hell wokeism is. Well, is me saying we need to pass the George Floyd Policing Act and we need to pass uh, uh, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the For the People Act, is that is that wokeism? Is me asking for the right to vote and not be murdered by the cops, is that too woke? What, what exactly is this wokeism that these people are mad about? No, what it boils down to is we want you black people to shut up and vote for the Democratic Party, even though we don't give you any policy. John McWhorter has been pitched to me several times. Oh, and God. I won't interview him because I find him to be arguing in bad faith. It, based on the interviews I've, I've heard, I, I listened to his NPR interview. I listened to his real time with Bill Maher interview. And I wish we had more context to talk about it. Uh, but I did want to get... What I have a strong feelings of what I think that he is doing and how he is doing it, but how would you describe what a guy like he, you know, he's got a new book out, so he's getting a lot of attention. And what what is his game? What what is his strategy? What is his style? There is always money to be made. I don't care if you're John McWhorter. I don't care if you are Ward Connerly. Uh, I don't care if you, I mean, the, the Paris Denard, um, there is always money to be made. Armstrong Williams, there's always money to be made as the black person or the woman who argues against the interest of black people as a whole or argues against pointing out the obvious structural racism and oppression that exists in this country. There's always going to be money in that. And what a lot of these people have done is they continue to move the goalposts because 25 years ago, it was, you know, racism isn't really a problem anymore. And then, you know, for a couple of years, it was, you know, when you get to the Obama era, then it was like, well, I mean, racism exists because that's just a part of the human condition, but it's not a limiting factor. And now you've gotten back to the, you know, post George Floyd era where it's like, yes, racism is here and it's here to stay. And you just have to learn how to deal with it. But it's not the reason for X, Y and Z. And all of these things are there's such a tremendous amount of effort being put in. To trying to dismiss or discount what is plain for the frickin eye to see, which goes back to what I was saying at the beginning about, say, taunting, it is plain to the eye that what the difference, that there's little or no difference between Ryan Tannehill doing the Jordan leap into the end zone and 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 DK Metcalf hugging a goalpost. They're both celebrations. But for some reason, the black person tends to get fined. 
and disparities in sentencing for the same crime for black people. I just had a conversation yesterday. I have to mention this, Pete. I had a conversation yesterday. I'm not going to go into massive detail in case this person hears this. But, you know, telling a story about an absolutely brutal encounter that this woman had with the police where cops put two guns to her head. Jesus. And when she was about 24 years old. And we were just relating they must our have been experience. really scared. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> Jesus and, Christ. And, 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 and we were relating how every single black person has a story like that in this country. And while this may not be the most eloquent way to say so, we're all college-educated, well-spoken, well-behaved black people, wink, wink, right? This sort of myth that if you behave well and if you follow the rules, then you don't have these kinds of encounters. And it's just not true. But that's where I can pick up on this conversation Mm -hmm. about law enforcement and always try Mm -hmm. to, because I think that black death is the the worst, of course, by the state, but... Mm -hmm. It's not nearly uh, the numbers there aren't as nearly as high as the amount of people who are regularly abused yep. uh, and and then putting minorities aside my own experience and white people's experience with law enforcement is so mm-hmm. often negative. Yep. And I personally have been brutalized by cops a couple of times. Gr- granted, I was running my mouth at them, which is part mm-hmm. of the great part about being white. But the, 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 the point I try to make is we need systemic reform on the entire establishment because they abuse people all the time. And by yes, the way, do. I probably would, too, if you gave me a badge and a gun, <laughs> I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure I would because I have the ego issue and the anger issue and the control issue and a lot of issues. And I don't think that's so I don't think it's a great idea. We have to reform the system regardless of marginalized communities and the way they're treated, which is horrible. That's the, so are the rest of us often treated that way by cops often. And, and, My whole and community's so, Facebook page, which is all white people is complaining about the police department in my town, which makes a tremendous amount of money because they're not pulling people over for things like speeding. There's been too many accidents. Like that's what they're complaining about right now. Seriously. Yeah. Well, and, but see, here's the thing, you know, Pete, because you know, again, we're in agreement on this. This is why, People like John McWhorter, Armstrong Williams years ago and all these different kinds of people, Mm. this is how they can make their money. Because what they try to argue is that, see, cops are just bad in general and they never want to listen to the fact that black people are like, we have a specific, I mean, you're obviously thinking you're like, yes, I understand what you're saying because it is a more extreme version of what I'm dealing with. What those people always want to argue is that these more extreme examples simply do not exist, or they try to uh, uh, microanalyze them to a degree that they can always say it's an individual situation, it's an individual circumstance. So when it comes to somebody like John McWhorter, and I do this, I mean, I understand, you know, obviously your 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 podcast, your producer, and everything else like that. But from my perspective, uh, when I guest host, when I podcast and stuff like that, I don't like arguing with with bad faith actors. So you know, I, I don't it. I, I am 100 percent sure that John McWhorter believes exactly what he's saying because it's convenient for him and it's ideologically well, yeah, but, comforting. But the thing, you know, the, the, the one point that he's missing, the thing that I really quibble is a weak word. He's talking. He's a linguist. He's talking about the language that the left mm-hmm. and the liberals use. Mm-hmm. And I don't give like, let's put it aside. Let's say I agreed with him. It's still progressives and Democrats who are advocating for policies that benefit marginalized communities that create opportunities for employment, healthcare, and education. Like leave the language aside. He's acting like Democrats aren't doing that. Like in the house, they absolutely are doing that. They passed a tremendous amount of legislation specifically just voting. Like it's such a a horrible argument that he's making about language when the only thing that matters is the vote. That's the only thing that matters. Do we need to talk about anything else? Well, see, but then, then the, (laughs) <laughs> the the argument would be, and and not only Pete, not only are you right in that regard where you talk about voting, but it's it's very funny. One of the sort of aftermath conversations has been, you know, 
in New Jersey and Virginia in particular, where they allow former felons to vote, where they allow voter registration on, you know, same day and everything else like that. Virginia has made voting even easier and Republicans won, which, you know, just goes to show that allowing people access to the vote is a universal good for democracy. It doesn't effing matter which party benefits in a particular electoral cycle. You benefit as a nation by allowing people to vote, which just exposes how disingenuous the laws are and the redistricting that you're seeing in North Carolina and Michigan and Georgia and and, and Florida and Texas right now, because they don't really care about the democratic process. They care about maintaining power and making sure that black and brown people cannot be equal and effective participants in democracy. But going back, as I said, specifically to McMurder and people of his ilk. It is not simply enough for them to deny the impact of institutional racism or deny the impact of structural racism. They often argue now, if they're feeling bold enough and they can get enough white patrons to sit there and scrub their chins and say, oh, my God, this is a good idea. (laughs) They they tend to argue that, in fact, policies meant to remedy these structural inequalities ultimately are harmful to black people and that our best option in this country is to fight, kick and scream against structural racism, because then and only then will we have gained the respect and the honor and the grace of white people, that if white people have to save us from the very restrictions that they impose upon us, then white people won't respect us, which has always made me laugh because I'm like the idea that black people have to engage in some collective activity to gain the respect of the majority of the white people in this country doesn't make sense. There's no historical precedent for it. There's no truth to it. And the reason that we know why is because black people woke up every single day for 400 freaking years in this country, worked from birth till dawn. And I mean birth because you had women who would give birth at two o'clock in the morning and still have to get up and thresh wheat and pick cotton and go back to bed the same day that they actually gave birth. And white people still had whole conferences, wrote books and made films about how stupid and lazy we were. So if the majority of white America could call black people lazy, even though we were doing all the damn labor in the country, then tell me how the hell it is that me getting a PhD is magically going to make some racist cop look at me. Say that last word again, different. Different. Yeah. With a hard R. You can. (laughs) Yeah. That was an amazing rant that I was thinking about, uh, like putting out like releasing Mm -hmm. because it was so great and and thoughtful and dramatic and then that last word cut out on your phone but i got it i'll edit it in that was uh yeah powerful very powerful uh, and thoughtful and i appreciate your perspective on on all of it i don't have anything to add well that's that's it's it's fine pete because i know i know that you're gonna fight the good fight uh, and and go keep knocking heads in your local student council. Me, on the other hand, I will be doing nothing of the sort because I get to I get to hang out in my HBCU where I don't have to have these arguments. <laughs> Ain't nobody. I was telling people I tweeted this. It was like what, viral a couple of weeks ago. I was like, I teach at a freaking HBCU. I don't teach critical race theory. I'm at a black school. But yeah, please, I saw like, that. Like, That's yeah, viral. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, what are you yeah. talking about? We don't teach this. I, dude, dude. I don't even. I am not lying. I. I I have had to learn about critical race theory since it has become a public discussion because I have a whole ass PhD in political science and never learned critical race theory because well, most people who know it, it are it in fairly, law school. Fairly obscure. <laughs> it was fairly obscure yes. even, even in law school. But the, the last point I wanted to make, just to reiterate, mm-hmm. you talk about the disagreement that folks have had across the political spectrum on what policies benefit people or if they somehow backfire trying to help someone with some kind of uh, government policy and, and backfires whether it's education health care employment whatever it is mm-hmm. i don't i don't want to argue with anybody about that until we can agree on voting like right. w- like one party is for voting we yeah. are you on the <laughs> voting rights act this right. is the only thing i care about anymore jason i don't want to talk about the education health employment policies that help or hurt mm-hmm. black people just where are you or, my, or minorities at all where are you on voting right now yep. anybody yep yep i agree and 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 i will tell you and i'm you know you, you see this with him online and 
any conversation you have with him, you know, Ellie is at, is one of the loudest voices on this mm-hmm. when it's like, you know, the legal restrictions we're facing. And I talk about all the time politically. I'm like, I could give a rat's derriere ultimately what happens with build back better or infrastructure or any of those things, because at the end of the day, you will not, the democratic party will not maintain control of both houses of Congress next year. If they do not pass comprehensive voting rights legislation, you have situations right now where Georgia, I mean, it, it, I'm not going to go to all the details on this, but you have situations right now where one, we know the census conducted last year was trash because Trump was trying to cheat. He was intentionally undercounting certain places. You have massive growth in a state like Georgia. Georgia should actually have two more congressional seats. They got none, right? Like, or I might've gotten one, but it was supposed to get two. Cause it was just, I mean, there's been massive growth in Georgia. Everybody talks about how much bigger Georgia is, how much the Atlanta, Metro Atlanta. I mean, this is an area that the metro area has grown by, what is it, like 1,500 people a month or, or 1,500 people a week or something crazy for like three years? Mm. You know, there's no way in heck that that state doesn't deserve additional districts, um, but they're not getting them because the census was conducted so badly. And, of course, you're trying to conduct a census during a once-in-a-lifetime, once-in-a-generation, once-in-a-century pandemic. You really should redo it because now what you've got or what you see in North Carolina, where, oh, I don't know, the Republicans control the state legislature, even though Trump only won the state 49 to 47, they're redrawing the districts so that Republicans have 79 percent of the seats in the state. Right. And if you don't pass comprehensive voting rights legislation, if Joe Manchin stands in the way of that, if they don't get aggressive about getting rid of the filibuster and the silly little rules, the Democrats will be gerrymandered out of their majority next year, yep. no matter how many yep. votes they get. Yep, yep. We've talked. I've talked about that with David Daly uh, several times, and and many yeah. others. It's it's the it's not very well understood or, or reported, as far as I can tell. It's the most important thing, though. It's hard it's for the some people to understand, but it's yeah, it's an issue of representation and voting, and 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 nothing else matters. Well, it's a fascinating conversation, and the points you make are hard to argue with, as as per use, uh, Jason. So <laughs> I will let you go. I appreciate it very much. It's been way too long, and then let's talk about other things. Yeah, yeah. Just, like, hit me up this weekend. We just catch up on some other stuff. Yeah. And, and, yeah, like, I actually need your advice on some things. So hit me yep. up this weekend. All right, buddy. Thank you. Love you, man. I appreciate Later. it. Later. Peace. All right. There he goes, Dr. Jason Johnson at DR. Jason Johnson on Twitter and you can watch him at MSNBC obviously listen to him on his podcast a word with Jason Johnson anywhere you find a podcast let him know that you enjoyed it and where you agree disagree and uh, I'd love to hear from you always so let's now move on shall we to my second guest of today's program he is one of the most respected climatologists climate scientists in the entire world he has written written several books he's got a new op-ed that he co-wrote in the boston globe he's a distinguished professor of atmospheric science and director of the earth system science center at penn state member of the national academy of science he's won all the prizes all the awards his new book is the new climate war and you got to get it. The fight to take back our planet. So good. So important. I caught up with Michael yesterday to talk about what's happened so far with COP26. We'll talk hopefully again next week to recap the whole thing. But also talking about American domestic politics and policy as well. Here's my latest with Michael Mann. You can follow him on Twitter at Michael E. Mann to end. Let him know that you heard him on the show. Let's go. Dr. Michael Mann right now. All right, Dr. Michael Mann joins me. We're going to talk about as many things as we can in 20 or so minutes, and I am so honored every time I get to talk to you, and people think I'm cool because I get to talk to you. Never thought. Oh, wow. It's always a pleasure to talk with you, my friend. Do you, what do you think about that? Like, you're, you're actually considered cool. Do your kids think you're cool? <laughs> well, I just have one, and, and she thinks that I am decidedly uncool. So, but, you know, when she hears that I was on the Pete Dominic uh, stand up, yeah. uh, you know, show, she'll, she'll have newfound respect for me. Well, so. I mean, like, she does know how many people name check her dad, right? I mean, like, pretty much everybody's dropping your name. Oh, I talked to my friend Michael Mann. I mean, she's got to know that. Like, she's got to be impressed. 
Uh, she she knows that um, you know people talk about me, uh, and sometimes they say nice things, and sometimes they say not so nice oh, things. Well, there's that too. Yeah, yeah. But no, it's uh, you know it, it's yeah. I, I guess I'm not like all of the other dads. Um, and uh, well, that's I spend awesome. A lot of my time down in the basement talking uh, to people about <laughs> climate change. <laughs> well, I'm happy to spend some time in your basement, my shed. Great to have you back, as always. Uh, COP26 is happening. We have to talk about, just help us understand a little bit, if you want, about the history of this conference. And, you know, you make an important point in in your op-ed that I'm linking to about this is the only framework we have. This is, it's so imperfect. There's so many problems with it. But if you've got another option to get all the the, the countries in the world together, then let us know. We'd love to consider it. What Right? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's sort of like our democracy, right? Um, it's the worst system, uh, except for all of the other possible systems. Right, and, right. you know, we uh, are frustrated by it constantly. And I'm sure we'll get into that. Some of our frustrations about our domestic politics certainly feed into the frustrations that we have right now about COP26 in Glasgow and whether or not we're seeing the sort of action that we'd really like to. And so you're absolutely right. Um, this framework uh, this United Nations framework, which has existed for decades, you know, it's the only framework we have for negotiating global agreements about carbon emissions and climate. And we have to work within that process, recognizing its flaws and, you know, doing what we can. And we're seeing, you know, children across the world right now and you know tens of thousands of them mar- marching in glasgow to put pressure on those policymakers to do what's right by us rather than doing what's convenient to the polluters uh, too often they you know become beholden to special yeah. interests and polluters and it's easy to understand why some younger folks are, are deeply cynical what we can't allow, as I, I said on Twitter uh, a few days ago, we can't allow that cynicism to sort of go cross that line into nihilism. Right. This, yeah. like, there's nothing we can do. Such an important point. And what you're describing is the fragmentation of the movement based on generation. It's the, the old guard like you. Uh, who have been on top of this issue for your entire career, writing books about it, advocating uh, the younger guard, like activists like Greta Thunberg, who you know people are familiar with, and our own, all of our kids, and so on. And then you've got issues with gender, you've got issues with race, and I say everybody's right, Michael. I say everybody's right, but the, the, at the same time, we're all trying to get something similar done. And so the whole argument that you're making is we can't let us we can't we can't be divided over this. But that's 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 very hard. What's going on? What is the fragmentation? Yeah, you know, there are bad actors. And, and I talk about this in, in the new climate war. Um, it's one of the tactics, you know, now that denial just isn't possible anymore. The forces of inaction, the inactivists, the fossil fuel interests, those doing their bidding, they can't deny climate change is happening because we can see it's happening. So they've turned to all these other tactics. And one of them is division, trying to divide and conquer, trying to sort of insert a wedge into the climate community and separate us on all of those natural fault lines, along all those natural fault lines, whether it's gender, race, um, or anything else. Um, Any division that they can create uh, online, on social media, using bot armies and trolls, um, it makes us, you know, it divides us and, and it makes us less effective because we no longer speak with one voice demanding action. So we have to recognize that there are bad actors out there who are trying to start, sort of stoke the, the fires of division. And we have to realize that we're being played and we have to resist. And sometimes it's difficult, but we have to resist that 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 tendency to become polarized over any n- number of things. And, 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 and age is a big part of that right now. In our recent uh, op-ed in the Boston Globe, we try to remind people that, you know, there are really important people in the climate movement at both ends of the age spectrum, yep. Greta Thunberg and the other youth climate protesters. But at the other end, you've got people like Richard Attenborough or, or David, David, uh, the brother, David Attenborough, yeah, yeah. sort of the voice of, of science and and, and nature um, and, you know, Jane Goodall. Yep. And so there are people of goodwill at both ends of the spectrum 
this isn't about age. It shouldn't be about age. Let's not allow them to divide us along those lines. Yeah. Bill Maher, on, in his uh, you know opinion piece at the end of his show last week, really had a very divisive piece about how young people are, are blaming old people. But th- Wait, Bill Maher just... was divisive? <laughs> Sorry. I mean, it's uh, he's so binary so often, too. It's like such in my it's so disappointing. But but the point is, you know, sometimes he makes me think I don't think he's right here, but it is. You know, this, this he was just making a point that there's uh, young people are more concerned or, or more familiar with, you know, the Kardashians or the Jenner or whoever they are than the Greta Thunbergs. Like they're not any more engaged than we were. And so they can stop blaming us. It's certainly not helpful, but it, it, it does. You know, apathy is still very ever present, especially with people of privilege. Yeah, it's true. And, you know, we, we tend to think we'd we'd like to think of, of sort of this very vibrant, widespread youth movement that is literally, you know, young folks around the world who are all out in the streets. But you're absolutely right. It's a pretty small sort of, you know, percent of of that age group. Um, it's that's sort of the issue public. Um, it's yeah. it, we're, what we're hearing from is pretty small, but fortunately, quite loud minority of young folks who really are out there demanding change. And you're right. There's a lot of apathy when it comes to younger folks. They haven't voted in nearly the numbers we would like to see them vote um, in recent elections. And part of why we're where we at, um, sadly, you know, with technically 50 Democrats, but really 48 Democrats and, and two, you know, uh, Democrats in name only who right now are blocking uh, any meaningful congressional climate action. Part of why we're where we're at and why we don't have larger Democratic majorities is because younger folks haven't voted in the numbers that we need them to. Yep. And that's the most yep. powerful yep. way to use your voice in the United States is to vote. And there's so much you can do for sustainability initiatives and pollution and all the other things that correspond with climate locally and in your state, too. So yeah. let's not get too you know hung Absolutely. up on the Senate or or less. Absolutely. I mean, you, you said they can't deny climate anymore, yet you know that they are. Uh, I tweeted the other day when the, what, second most powerful Republican in the House, Steve Scalise, completely denied climate oh, yeah, change. I, I, yeah. And I said, I, I, I heard Michael Mann's head blow up from state college. <laughs> it's hours away. It took it took us days to put it back together. <laughs> I mean, this dumpty. is what we came up with it, you know, <laughs> um, yeah, sort of Frankenstein. No, I mean, it's uh, you know, it, it, it's funny because that got a lot of play and it certainly sort of raised the hackles of all of us who care about this issue. But recognize that Steve Calise, Scalise right now um, is far and away. Uh, in the minority, even of the Republican Party right now, most of them recognize that it's not even a productive strategy to deny what people can see. It's much more sensible as a strategy to engage not in outright denial, but downplaying. Oh, it's not that bad. Dividing us. So, you know, we don't speak with one voice, as I said before, deflecting attention away from the needed policies to individual lifestyle. This is one of the things I talk about in the book. Sure, we should live, you know, the most the greenest lifestyles we can, but that's not a substitute for carbon pricing and subsidies for renewables and blocking new fossil fuel infrastructure and all these things that we need our policymakers to do. So they have been very effective at using these other tactics to prevent action. Relatively few, um, even you know, uh, prominent Republicans these days are outright climate deniers. But every once in a while, one of them will step up to the plate. And, and there's Steve Scalise reminding us that there is still hardcore denial um, in the Republican Party. Uh, but uh, by and large, they've moved on to softer denial and all these other tactics because, you know, they don't care about how they prevent climate action and how they prevent decarbonization and moving away from fossil fuels. They just care that we don't move off fossil fuels. Right, right. Well, I want to ask you about Joe Manchin. I want to ask you about COP, but let me just real quick. What did you think of the hearings? The House, uh, I forget which committee that 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 uh, had all of the oil and gas executives up there. How do you think that went in terms of from, you know, the vantage point of the CEOs, the leadership of those companies and the the, the folks in Congress questioning them? Because there were a lot of Republicans that were you know, on their side and apologizing for them. And obviously a lot of Democrats like Katie Porter and others really took them to task. What, what did you take away from it? 
Yeah, it was, you know, we were hoping it would sort of be that a tobacco executive moment in the, in the climate change uh, arena. Right. You know, decades ago, there was that uh, now famous uh, congressional hearing where all these tobacco CEOs were forced to take the oath and they all lied under oath. They claimed that they didn't know that their product um, was highly addictive and killed people, even though all the internal documents showed that they knew that. Same thing with the fossil fuel industry. Exxon Mobil, uh, for example, at that hearing, other fossil fuel companies denying that they've been engaged in efforts to misrepresent the science, to attack the science and the scientists. And, and we know that's wrong. I've been at, at the receiving end of their attacks. Um, and so, yeah, they basically flat out lied, just like the tobacco executives lied. The question is, um, is are there going to be any repercussions for that? And, and that's where, you know, I would like to see Democrats in Congress take it to the next level. Um, if these people lied under oath, you know, that is perjury. Let, let's enforce it. Um, th because this is an even greater crime. Uh, lying about the addictive and, and deadly impacts of tobacco was bad enough. But lying about climate change, uh, climate, you know, the climate crisis is going to cost far more lives. Already is. Yeah. Yeah. Tobacco. Yeah. It's a, a, a absolutely uh, integral point to it. So let's talk just briefly about the Senate and one guy, Joe Manchin, whose work you're very familiar with. His state is, of course, uh, a, a big coal state, although we can talk about how many coal jobs are left there. We can talk about how many renewable jobs there could be. Maybe we could just report uh, repair all the mountains uh, tops that they took off and, or put windmills or panels on them. Either way, w you know, wh why is this such a difficult thing for him? It's also easy to look at him and tie him to that money. Yeah. As well, I mean, but it's it seems so cynical to say it's just about reelection. It's just about the money. Yeah. It seems like it's a lot just about power and, and, and control. But well, how do you how do you read this man, this senator in West Virginia? And, and what if anything could be done to get him to vote the right way and think the right way when it comes to energy and climate? Yeah, well, you know, there's that, that famous adage um, attributed to uh, Upton Sinclair. It's very difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding right. it. And I would say um, I, I take issue with you slightly. It is about the money, but it's about the money that Joe Manchin is pocketing. Um, he has, you know, something like five hundred thousand in, dollars invested in coal. Um, he gets or he, he gets dividends, um, you know, uh, thousands of dollars. Yep. Um, and he is heavily invested in coal. He is tied closely to uh, coal barons in West Virginia. And, and that's what it's about. You know, individuals, there are relatively few jobs now in the coal industry. It's uh, highly automated. Um, there are far more jobs, as you alluded to, in installation of, of, of new renewable energy. And by the way, in the civilian climate core, that uh, is part of the Biden plan, which Joe Manchin uh, thus far is unwilling to get behind. Part of the, the Biden plan and, and part of this uh, larger reconciliation bill would be funding to actually hire people, to provide jobs for people um, in these old uh, coal towns, uh, cleaning up um, the, the mess that was made, um, cleaning up brown fields, uh, plugging old wells. Um, so put them to work, actually helping fix the environment and provide clean energy jobs in the form of wind, solar, et cetera. That's the path that is going to be more profitable for us as a country that will provide more jobs. But double, you know, doubling down in coal makes more money for a small number of coal barons and Joe Manchin. Yeah. Well, there's no doubt about it. He's making more money off it. Uh, my, my point was just like, it can that be that much of a motivation? I don't know. Mike, I, I always think well, that he once likes he likes his Maserati, as you probably know, oh, I saw you know, that. He, he clearly likes his yachts and his Maseratis. Well, you know, I looked into the yacht thing and apparently he bought this boat for $250,000, which is a shitload of money for a boat. And now it's worth like $700,000. But like, even if I was going to give him the benefit of the doubt that he lived on a houseboat, uh, you know, in D.C., when I saw him driving in a Maserati, I was like a little on the nose, dude. Like, are you playing like a, a, a role of villain politician? Like you're a you're a coal baron, you know, uh, associated senator holding up. It's just so. Was odd. I the only one who had the, the Joe Walsh song going through my head? Um, what is it? I, I drive my uh, 
you know, a, a Maserati. Um, yeah. You know, Joe Walsh of the Eagles had that song. Um, I got to look up the lyrics. My then. Maserati goes 185. I forget exactly. This is easily. <laughs> now I lost my license. Now I can't drive. So, yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's what I was thinking about as Joe Manchin was driving his Maserati and being surrounded by hordes of climate activists who uh, chased him back into the the subterranean garage <laughs> that he was emerging. Yeah, just remarkable stuff. Yeah, somebody should rewrite that Joe Walsh song and just amend it with with you know Joe Manchin things about his life. My, my Maserati does one eighty five. I lost my license. Now I don't drive. I have a limo ride in the back. I lock the doors in case I'm attacked. It's starting to really sound like Joe Manchin's uh, life because <laughs> he's, he's certainly being targeted. Uh, life by, imitating by art. Life imitating art. Yeah. Uh, so so let's talk about um, I mean, do you think, by the way, I, the thing that's frustrating is that I hear so many kind of of my friends, you know, uh, progressive minded politicos, strategists talking about, you know, Joe Biden just needs to do this. They've got to get Joe Manchin. Like, I actually don't think there's any leverage. I heard somebody suggest that they should invest, you know, DOJ should investigate his daughter. But that's not that's not what we do. The president can't tell DOJ to invest like that's just that's I just no better than, than Donald Trump. Well, exactly right. We don't that. want to. But yeah. even if even yeah. if they were like it's not, the point is, do you see any leverage point to 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 make you can't primary him? You, so what do you do? Is there anything that you've seen that you think would work to get Joe Manchin to change his vote? We have to try to appeal to his is decency. There's got to be, you know, da- deep down somewhere in there, um, you know, uh, uh, an individual, uh, you know, a human being who uh, sort of does ultimately doesn't want to be to go down in history as a villain, because that's what he will. He, you know, mm. if he ends up blocking meaningful no climate progress and so many other programs that are locked up right now in that reconciliation package, um, he's going to go down in history as a villain. Is that what he wants? Is that how he wants his children and grandchildren to think about him? You know, I've heard some stories uh, about, um, you know, fossil fuel executives whose children who follow the youth climate movement, who follow you know, Greta Thunberg and the others whose children have come up to them and said things like, you know, daddy, why are you destroying hmm. the planet? It's got to have an effect. Well, it's, got, I mean, it's hard. Them. We should yeah. get more of those fossil fuel giants, children and grandchildren, your book. <laughs> Your books. Uh, speaking of which, uh, there's an update to the hockey stick, huh? Uh, w- w- that's not good. Slash, it proves you right. Yeah, you know, it's one of those things I wish we were wrong. I wish we were wrong, you know, more than two decades ago when we first published the hockey stick graph. This graph, it's shaped like a hockey stick. The blade is the abrupt warming that we've seen over the past century. The handle is this relatively flat you know, variation in temperature over the preceding thousand years. And it really drove home the profound nature of the impact uh, that we are having on the planet with carbon pollution and warming. Um, now in this new study, and, and this new study sort of incrementally built on, on some other previous studies that had in fact extended, if you will, the hockey stick back, not just a thousand years, but now uh, like 20,000 years. And the blade of the hockey stick has gotten sharper because we've warmed since 1998 We've warmed uh, the better part of, you know, a a half a degree. Uh, And so that's where we are now. We are at the tip of the blade of the hockey stick and and that blade is getting sharper and sharper. And that really underscores the need for dramatic action now. What about COP26? Uh, You've written about some of the progress that's been made. Hopefully I'll be able to catch up with you next week. But there's a lot that remains to, to you know, to be seen yeah. at the end of this week. We're going to know a lot more. We're talking on a Wednesday. This will post on a Thursday. So what, you know, what have you seen and heard so far? I mean, you write about it, uh, some improvements when it comes to issues uh, regarding methane and deforestation. Not enough, as always the case. But w- what progress has have, have there been made? And what do you, you know, what do you what do you hope to see by the end of this week? Yeah, it's a work in progress, so we can't really judge it yet. A lot of people have sort of prejudged COP26, and Mm -hmm. in part based on sort of optics that sometimes don't look very good. You know, the fact that they're fossil fuel industry, people who are, you know, inside those negotiations to some people, you know, that's that's understandably uh, off-putting. It's difficult to keep them out in a process that's supposed to be open. But, you know, the the optics at times uh, don't 
don't help. Um, and yet, if you sort of try to take a sober, you know, take a step back and, 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 and take a sober look at what we've achieved so far. Yeah, there's the, the methane stuff and the deforestation. And, and that's 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 not the big piece. The big piece is our burning of fossil fuels uh, and the ele elevation of carbon dioxide pollution that's warming the atmosphere. And we've got to do something about that. And the commitments that have been made now uh, up in, you know, to today. So we came in with certain commitments from various countries as to how much they were willing to cut their carbon emissions during these proceedings over the last uh, week and a, and a half now, um, countries have come in with more stringent uh, commitments. Uh, India, for the first time, committed to uh, bringing down carbon emissions um, wow. by, uh, you know, not, not until, uh, you know, the, 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 they, they agreed to uh, bring their net carbon emissions down to zero in 2070. That's pretty far down the road, but it's better than their previous position, which was we're never going to do it. Um, and so if you total it all up based on the commitments we have now, for the first time, the estimates are that the commitments that are on the table now likely hold warming below two degrees Celsius. Now that's good because that's a whole lot better than four degrees Celsius, you know, seven degrees Fahrenheit warming of the planet, which is where we were headed, you know, uh, less than a decade ago, because of all these commitments that have been made now, we've cut that warming projection in half. But a couple things here. First of all, two degrees is too much. We've got to keep warming below one and a half degrees Celsius, right. about three degrees Fahrenheit to prevent the worst impacts of climate change. And these are commitments. The, this is politicians talking the talk. We need them to walk the walk and walking the walk. What does that mean? It means no new fossil fuel infrastructure. It means uh, doing away with coal um, quickly. Um, it means a whole bunch of things that thus far, the various uh, heads of state of the major polluters have not yet agreed to. And so, again, it's good that we've got these pledges. It's good that they're moving us in the right direction, but they have to be backed up by action. And that's not all going to happen here, um, you know, this week in Glasgow. That's going to happen because we continue to, to keep the pressure up after Glasgow. This is not the end of the process. This is the beginning. How much did we lose the four years of Trump? Um, is there any way to, to measure that? Um, it, it's difficult because a lot of it had to do with sort of the subtle um, aspects of diplomacy. Uh, yeah. The fact that uh, we backed off under Trump uh, on our commitment under the Paris Accord provided an excuse uh, to China to back off in their own efforts. And they were on the right path. Uh, China was decommissioning coal-fired power plants. They were exceeding their commitments. But then Trump came in, signaled to the rest of the world that the United States was no longer willing to take a leadership role here. And we saw China, the, the largest polluter today, we are the largest legacy polluter. We've put more carbon pollution, you know, cumulative carbon pollution into the atmosphere than any other country. Yeah. But China is is putting more carbon pollution into the atmosphere right now. We need them to be on board. And what we lost was that sort of moral standing, that leadership that we had had that helped bring others like China to the table. We lost it. We're, we, we've got it back now to an extent. The Biden administration, they've made a bold pledge um, under John Kerry, who's the special envoy uh, on climate for the administration, who's been negotiating with China and others. We're back at the negotiating table. We're back taking a leadership role. There's a little bit of, um, you know, uh, probably doubt in the minds, you know, of, of some leaders as to whether can we can they trust that we're back for good right. yep. or could we lapse once again into, uh, you know, a Trumpist politics? And, and so that has hurt things. It's set us back tremendously. It's hard to estimate just how much because it's where it's really set us back is in terms of the, the moral leadership that we had on this issue and the extent to which that was bringing others on board. What you spent a, like a sabbatical in Australia? What's, I did. And you mentioned them. You, you, you call them out in your article in the Boston Globe that you co-wrote. What's their deal? Why? I mean, after the wildfires, like, you know, we can we talk about the American fossil fuel industry and campaign finance and Republican orthodoxy and all that. Like, what's up with Australia? Is it similar issues down there? Just money and, and fossil fuel industry? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, we now, uh, you know, we no longer have a climate change a denier and delayer um, as, uh, you know, uh, chief executive. Um, we've, we've got somebody who leads on this issue, but Australia still does have somebody like that. Scott Morrison, who's a conservative, um, he is beholden to fossil fuel interests, but there's huge pressure on him. The Australian people get it, in my view. I spent, as you mentioned, some time there. I had to come back early because of COVID, but I spent uh, the better part of half a year um, and really got to know Australia and Australians well. And uh, frankly, I, I really like them. Um, and I think that as a whole, they really get it and that they're frustrated that they don't have the leadership that they deserve. Yep. Um, and, and, you know, the, we could talk a whole lot about why that's the case. And as poisonous as the Murdoch media empire here is in the United States with Fox News, um, the New York Post, et cetera, yep. um, it's far worse in Australia. The Murdoch media has a near stranglehold um, on, on uh, Australia's media environment. And in spite of that, Australians have, have remained relatively um, resistant to the misinformation and the disinformation. But it's been enough to win conservatives elections. Now, this is going to be the first election. Uh, the the upcoming election, which will happen sometime over the next year, will be the first national election since the Black Summer that I lived through with Australians is a couple of years. Is that what they years. call it? They call it the Black Summer because that's what it was. Heat burnt. And drought and wildfires, bushfires that yeah. blanketed the continent. Um, that's what they call it. And this is going to be the first national election since that happened. And so I am hopeful we will see a change, um, a, a, a change there in their leadership. But, you know, right now, Scott Morrison's running the show and Australia has not been a good faith partner in these global negotiations thus far. I appreciate you talking to me, Michael, and I appreciate all the work that you're continuing to do and lead on this. And I'll hopefully touch base with you next week to find out, to get your conclusions on the conclusion of COP26. Always a pleasure, my friend. Always a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much, Pete. Looking forward to talking again. There he goes, Dr. Michael Mann. Always a pleasure to have him joining me. I'm going to get him and Peter Totes on together to talk about how as guys, they, they, they wanted to be scientists. That's all they want to do is, 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 is do science and teach science. And now they are have, they have threats on their lives all the time because they promote vaccines and, and talk about climate change. And it's just sad. But I'm going to try to get them both on together. And that would be a fascinating conversation. Looking forward to making that happen for you. Maybe next week. Maybe I'll have that happen next week. Have that. All right. Well, I'm out of time for today. Thanks again to Dr. Jason Johnson. And, of course, Dr. Michael Mann. Thank you to Pete Coe for the jingles. John Carroll for the music. Welcome to all the new subscribers. I hope to see you tonight at our virtual happy hour hangout every Thursday, 80s. And you can always hang out and talk on the Discord platform. There's always a conversation going on there as well. But now it's time for me to say goodbye and post this podcast up for you to listen to. And I can't thank you enough for it. Okay, John Carroll is a singer, a songwriter, a Grammy Award winning member of our community, and we love him. He sings us out every day. Take it away, Johnny. Could begin, they had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no 
better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try and rise up. Show obedience to the voice inside. And listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide. It says stand up. 